is now it is now time for a question period. The member for Whitby, Ottawa. My question is to the Premier. Premier, just one week ago, we heard some damning testimony from the Ontario Power Authority CEO, Colin Anderson. In his testimony, he stated that everyone knew, including you, that the cost to cancel the Oakville Power Plant was far higher than the $40 million that your Liberal government claimed. Premier, unlike the NDP, we're here to hold you accountable with respect to these decisions. Premier, when did you know that the cost was far higher than $40 million, and will you finally apologize to taxpayers for not letting them know what you knew when you knew it? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, I did appear before the committee for an hour and a half. I answered all of the questions. I said that I was going to do that. I followed through, Mr. Speaker, and I have done everything in my power to make sure that all of the information, all of the documents were available and that the committee had the scope, Mr. Speaker, to be able to, uh, to, be able to ask the questions that it needed to ask. So, Mr. Speaker, I want, to be, I want to be very clear that I take full responsibility now, Mr. Speaker, for putting in place a plan that will improve the siting of large energy infrastructure in the future. Here, here. And we, we made an announcement yesterday, Mr. Speaker. We're going to work to develop new uh, regional energy uh, plan, a new re regional energy planning process. Uh, we're, there will be the components of strong public consultation, formal, mun formal municipal Answer. input, Mr. Speaker, a better decision-making process. That's what we need Attorney to take General. from this exercise, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, Premier, over the past few days, you've been asked on multiple television and radio shows to apologize for spending more than $600 million to cancel gas plants. You were even pushed by Matt Galloway on Metro Morning to apologize. You refused. Premier, hardworking Ontarians deserve accountability. They deserve to know that every one of their tax dollars is treated with respect and not indifference. We won't be sidetracked by a couple of splashy expenditures. We will do what the people of Ontario have elected us to do, and that is to hold you accountable. Premier, as leader of the province, don't you owe taxpayers an apology, or will you continue to put party ahead of province? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, you know, I, I respect, I absolutely respect the role of the opposition and its responsibility to, to push government and to ask difficult questions and to force open difficult issues. But, Mr. Speaker, I have not been resistant to that. I have opened up the process. I have been very open and transparent about making sure that all documentation would be available, Mr. Order. Speaker, to, by making sure that there was a process in place. Because remember, Mr. Speaker, Speaker, we suggested a select committee. From Oxford, we suggested that the, the mandate of the Justice Committee be broadened so that all questions could be asked. And I have said repeatedly, Mr. Speaker, that I regret that the decisions were not made differently. I regret that the upfront process was not better and that those gas plants were located, that the decision was made to locate them in that place in the first place, Mr. Speaker. So we need a better process going forward. Final supplementary. Thank you. Well, Premier, it's pretty clear that you don't really think you owe us anything on this side of the House, but I think that at the cost of $600 million House leader, come to order. deserve an apology from you. They've paid enough for it. You are the leader of the Liberal Party. You're also the leader of this province. Isn't it time to act with leadership and take ownership of this decision? Premier, you've been asked in committee. You've been asked in this House multiple times, but still you continue to dodge the question. So I'm going to ask you, and Ontarians deserve an answer to this, will you finally apologize to the taxpayers of Ontario for the $600 million that you spent to save a few Liberal seats? Much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think the member opposite actually hit on something very important when she, she raised the issue of ownership. I have taken ownership of this issue, Mr. Speaker. I have said clearly that our government member implemented for a decision come to that, order. Was, that was agreed to by all of the parties, but we took the responsibility to implement that decision. Your timing was awful. The member from Northumberland come to order, just as I got it quiet. So that's timing. Everyone else just kind of bring it down. 
Premier. Take responsibility for a process that was not right, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. I take responsibility for putting in place a new process. I regret that the process was what it was. I wish that we had not been in this situation. But, Mr. Speaker, my responsibility is to the people of Ontario. The opposition has a role in forcing open yes, those issues, and we've been working with them. We are going to develop a new regional energy policy, Mr. Speaker. Strong public consultation, formal municipal input, better decision making, the right location at the beginning, Mr. Speaker. OPA and Thank IESO you. to report. Thank you. New question, the member from Nipissing. Speaker, my question this morning is for the Premier. Premier Dalton McGuinty followed the same dodge and weave approach at the Justice Committee this morning in an attempt to do what he's always done and that is to put the Liberal Party's interests ahead of the interests of the people. He failed to be forthright to the same question that you, Premier, failed to answer 32 times last week. When did you know that the Oakville gas plant cancellation was more than $40 million? We have sworn testimony from several witnesses, including uh, Colin Anderson of the Ontario Power Authority, who swore everybody in the government knew it was more than $40 million. Premier, you had eight cabinet interactions with these gas plant deals. We know you know the answer. When did you know the Oakville Question. cancellation cost was more than $40 million? Very much, Mr. Speaker, and I know that the government House Leader is going to want to speak to the details of the uh, committee interaction today, but I will just say, Mr. Speaker, I, will come to order I answered time. the questions that I was asked, Mr. Speaker. I was there for an hour and a Mr. half, Huda. and I answered every question that was asked of me, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Huda. I told the members of the committee what I know, and, uh, and they're, they're, thereby doing the people of Ontario know what I knew and when I know, knew it, Mr. Speaker. And I have been clear that what we need to do now is we need to make sure that this doesn't happen again, that we have a better process going forward for locating and siting these, uh, these large infrastructure projects, Mr. Speaker. That's what the process is about. That is the process that we are developing, regional energy plans, Mr. Speaker, and that is why the IESO and the OPA will report by August 1st on that, on that new process that will have Answer. strong municipal input and a strong consultative component, Mr. Speaker. Just a reminder before you ask for supplementary, I remind all members that any member in this House is to be referred to by their, either their writing or their title. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, that's not quite accurate, Premier. I asked you, and the member from Nepean Carleton asked you, 32 different times when you knew. We still have not received that answer from you. Minister, the but your predecessor the told the Justice Committee this morning that he had no limit to the cost he was willing to spend to cancel these power plants. He tried to insist he didn't know anything about the costs of Oakville and Mississauga cancellations when documents showed he knew everything. And in fact, his staff actually negotiated with the Oakville proponent. The do documents show there were government-instructed counteroffers over three times. Several witnesses have testified to the buckets of costs that were well known. Spe uh, Premier, I ask you again, who knew? The answer we got from Colin Anderson was Orson. everybody. I'll ask you. Tell us the date when you knew the Oakville cancellation was more than $40 million. Thank you. When did you know? Uh, uh, House Leader. House Leader. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I can't, I can't help but comment how amusing it is that we're having a discussion here today about various witnesses in front of the committee. The member from Chatham can't come to order. Premier, the former the Premier. member from Renfrew, come to order. Two, Two former ministers of energy, Mr. Speaker, that have come forward, and yet, Mr. Speaker, we still await to hear from the Progressive Conservative Party. We await the testimony of the. This is, this is getting ridiculous. I'm getting heckling from the person on the side who's giving the answer. So please, control yourselves. And the same thing on the other side. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, we're waiting to hear from the Leader of the Opposition about his costing, about his analysis, about— And I'll ask the member from Stormont to come to order. You got me up. That means something. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, we want to hear from the Leader of the Opposition about his analysis, about his costing, while he went out, starred in a YouTube video surrounded by adoring candidates, and told people that if he was elected Premier, Answer. it would be done, done, done. Mr. Speaker, we have been forthcoming on this side. Perhaps the Honourable Member in his supplementary will talk about when Thank the Leader you. of the Opposition and when various PC candidates will— 
Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I'm glad you're amused, uh, House Leader. Unfortunately, the taxpayers of Ontario are not amused with your $585 million bill. Premier, you said these gas plant cancellations were political decisions. Lost Basically, confidence. you and your former Lost leader confidence. rolled the dice in, an, in order to win a majority government, One trying to win those five seats, which you ended up winning. Sadly, it did not give you the majority government. You're one seat shy, which is why the PC is sadly for you, luckily for the province of Ontario and the taxpayers. That's why our party and the NDP have the majority in the committees. That's Attorney why General, we actually order, have the these time. hearings today. In 2011, <clears throat> Dalton McGuinty was premier and you were vice chair of the campaign. You signed off on the cabinet minutes Washington. for this Oakville deal. Your government can't be trusted, Premier. Will you call our confidence motion to here, the floor here, here. for a vote? Call it. Government House Leader. Speaker, let, let's remind everyone who Jeff Yanisik is. He was the progressive conservative candidate in Mississauga South, Mr. Speaker. The member from the PN Carleton. Again, it's a timing thing. Come to order. No, uh, no other words said. Thank you. And on both sides. Please finish. Mr. Speaker, he sent out thousands of robocalls to the citizens of Mississauga South saying the only way the to cancel the gas plant was to vote for Tim Hudak and the Progressive Conservatives. Mr. Speaker, we have called him before the committee several times and he has told the clerk to stop calling him. Oh. Let's talk about let's talk about Marianne de Monte Whalen, who put out this brochure to thousands of people in his riding saying the only party that will stop the Sherway power plant is the Ontario PC party. Oh. On October 6, vote on Terry C. She agreed to come to the committee, Mr. Speaker, in the last minute, suspiciously declined and has Thank refused you. to appear yet. And, Mr. Speaker, Thank I you. could go on. With uh, no, you won't. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. In tough times, people need to know that public dollars are being managed responsibly and well. And as we look at the budget proposed by this government, those questions are more important than ever, Speaker, especially when we consider the hundreds of millions of dollars Liberals spent cancelling private power deals in Oakville and Mississauga. Can the Premier tell us whether the government knew what the cost would be when cancelling those private power deals or whether they just didn't care? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I have uh, I've gone before committee and I have answered the questions that were asked of me. And the reality is, Mr. Speaker, the relocation of these large infrastructure projects was going to cost. It was going to cost money, and that is it's unfortunate. And I have said I regret that, Mr. Speaker. But the reality is that. Every party in this House, Mr. Speaker, believed that those gas plants should not be located in those places, Mr. Speaker. So all of the candidates were campaigning in that community on cancelling those uh, those gas plants, Mr. Speaker. So it's true. We implemented that decision. We took the responsibility to implement a decision that everyone in this House agreed to, Mr. Speaker. And the, it's unfortunate that there wasn't a better process in place. And our responsibility yes, is to make sure that going forward, we have a better process so we will not be in this position again. Absolutely. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I want to ask the Premier a question that her predecessor refused to answer this morning. Was there any limit to what the government was prepared to spend? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, you know, I, I understand that the, uh, the leader of the third party um, wants, wants, this, wants the answers to these questions, but we have provided the answers, Mr. Speaker. We made a decision that the gas plants needed the to be relocated. The members from Hamilton East Stoney Creek come to order. We then had to order. enter into a negotiation, Mr. Speaker, and that was, that was what was, uh, what was Essex, undertaken. The members Essex, Because it was the right decision to move those gas plants. The people in the communities made it very clear, and it was politicians who decided that we would respond and that we would would move those gas plants as, the, as both opposition parties agreed to, Mr. Speaker. We implemented that decision. There was a cost attached to it. Thank we need you. a better process going forward. Final supplementary. 
Well, no matter how much the Premier refuses to acknowledge it, I was actually asking him a question. How much would it cost before we were prepared to actually tear up any contracts? But you know what? The government signed the contracts. They knew what was, was in those contracts. The government had some of the highest paid legal advice going. They knew what the cost would be. The last Premier knew what the cost was going to be high, and, and this Premier knew as well that it was going to be high. But at every stage of the process, the Liberal government has done everything they could to hide the real cost and the details from the public who would be paying the bills. Is the Premier not only ready finally to apologize, but to even go one better, Speaker, and acknowledge that this government has failed to make transparent and accountable decisions and that this needs to change for the people of Ontario? Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the leader of the New Democratic Party can't have it both ways. Her candidates were out in both Oakville and Mississauga talking about the opposition to the power plants. Let me quote from what uh, was said in front of the Justice Committee. Frank Clegg, Chairman for Citizens for Clean Air, we met with all the parties and all the candidates and were given commitments by every candidate in the Oakville area that they would support cancelling the plant. Uh, he went on to say C4CA was very pleased that all parties publicly committed to stop the construction of the proposed Oakville plant. Let me tell you about Greg Rohn, Coalition of Homeowners for uh, Intelligent Power. He told the, the Justice Committee, yes, the NDP, they were against the plan. Mayor Hazel McCallion, Mr. Speaker, someone I wouldn't want to mess with, she said, and I quote, the impression that was certainly given beyond a doubt, I think all parties would have cancelled it. There's no question about it. Mr. Speaker, Answer. the Progressive Conservative Party, the New Democratic Party, the Liberal Party, we all had the exact same position. Thank you. New question? Leader of the Third Party. My next question is for the Premier Speaker. The Premier knows the earth, these are tough times. People know that their money is being people need to know rather that their money is actually being spent in a way that is responsible and that is accountable. Instead, they see the government waste half a billion dollars on gas plants in Oakville and Mississauga and watched as one premier after another tried to prevent them from seeing these costs, try to hide those costs from them. New Democrats think the budget needs some accountability because the people are tired of, of seeing scarce dollars spent as if it's the personal bankroll of the governing party. Does the Premier understand why people deserve to see more accountability in their government? Thank you very, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I just really have to, I have to uh, uh, disagree with the, uh, the premise of the question in, in the sense that since I have been in this office, Mr. Speaker, I have done everything in my power to open up this process and to allow for the questions to be asked and answered and documentation to be available. I wrote to the AG, to the uh, Auditor General in Oakville, to look at the Oakville situation. He agreed to do that. I immediately called the House back, Mr. Speaker. We struck committees. We expanded the scope of the committee because the way the questions were being asked, Mr. Speaker, they were very narrow, and I thought that the committee needed to be able to look at the whole situation. We offered documents from across government, Mr. Speaker. I appeared at the committee. Mr. Speaker, the committee has been meeting since February, has heard from 25 witnesses. I have done everything Answer. possible to open up this process and to be accountable to the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. That is my responsibility. And more than that, I take responsibility for a better process going forward. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, there's one thing that the Premier misses, and that's the fact that the people actually want answers, not just the process to get there, but the actual answers. Today, the former Premier testified at the Justice Committee. The Premier, who famous, famously said, and I quote, on the matter of the cost, Speaker, it's $40 million. We nailed that down, unquote. Yeah, but, of course, that wasn't even close to accurate, Speaker. Does the Premier understand that a justifiably sceptical public wants to see a government that's accountable to them when it comes to public money. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I absolutely do understand that, and I understand that, and that is the reason that when I came into this office, I said that the process needed to be opened up so that answers could be found, Mr. Speaker, and I am as frustrated as the leader of the third party that the numbers have changed, that it's been very difficult in this complex issue to nail down numbers, Mr. Speaker. But at the same time, I don't think that the people of Ontario would want us not to talk about how to move forward, how to put a better process in place, how to make sure 
sure that we get a budget cost, Mr. Speaker, that actually will deal with some of the things that are affecting their everyday lives. Making sure that youth unemployment strategy is in place, Mr. Speaker. Making sure that we are going to be able to invest in the roads and bridges in their communities so companies will come to their communities, Mr. Speaker. Making sure that we're putting the business supports in place so manufacturing can, can flourish and that we can have we can Answer. bring business to the province. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I think that some of the issues, many of the issues the uh, leader Thank of the third you. party has raised are addressed in our budget, Thank and you. I hope she will work with us. Well, there's one thing that the Premier fails to recognize, Speaker, and that is people want their government to treat them with respect and their money with prudence. And that's all they want. But then they see their government waste half a billion dollars on gas plants just to put a few Liberal Party members first. They expect their government to be fiscally responsible so that we can afford to put families first, Speaker, not Liberals. But instead, they see a government who barely paid lip service to closing brand new tax loopholes that will cost Ontarians $1.3 billion, not just once, but every single year. Will the Premier admit that her budget fails badly short on accountability and transparency. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, I really believe that the people of Mississauga and Oakville deserve to uh, deserve to have a voice in this and I know that there have been there have been voices raised on this they were very concerned about the location of those gas plants mr. speaker and their their representatives raised those issues over and over again mr. speaker and made it clear that it was not a good idea for those gas plants to be located there which is why candidates from all three parties were campaigning and saying that all three parties were committed to relocating those gas plants mr. Mr. Speaker. So I have the deepest of respect for the people of Ontario, and I have the deepest of respect for the people who live in all of the communities in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. That's why we acted on the promise that had been made by all three parties. That's why we've written a budget that focuses on getting people jobs and helping them in their everyday lives, Mr. Speaker. And I hope the third party will work with us on that. Earlier this morning, Dalton McGuinty uh, appeared before committee and said, I withdraw. Thank you. Old habit. Uh, the member from Ottawa South uh, testified at committee and said it was, quote, unquote, the right thing to do to cancel those power plants in the middle of an election. You admitted last week that, that it was a political decision, so we can only conclude it was a right thing to do politically for the Liberal Party of Ontario. Earlier today, he also refused to acknowledge how much was too much in order to uh, cancel those power plants and save those seats. We don't know a billion, two billion, three billion. He wouldn't say, Speaker. We also know that Carol Jamison, that uh, sorry, Shelley Jamison, Joanne Butler, Colin Anderson, David Livingston, and, and David Lindsay all said that you knew from the outset how much this was. Are you refusing to tell the assembly what you knew when you knew it on ter in terms of those costs? Because you're afraid that your caucus and you will be Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I went before a committee. I told the committee what I know. I know that the, uh, the uh, government house leader is going to want to speak to the details of, uh, of the committee uh, actions. But, Mr. Speaker, I'm not afraid. I was not afraid to go to committee. I was not afraid to say what I knew, Mr. Speaker. And I believe, I believe categorically that the decision that was made was in the best interest of the people of Mississauga, the people of Oakville, and we need a better process going forward, Mr. Speaker. On the issue of of the political decision. I have said quite clearly that it was a decision that was made by politicians, yeah. and it was a decision that was going to be made by Liberal politicians or Conservative politicians or NDP politicians, Mr. Speaker, and that is the extent to which it was a political decision. We all agree Answer. that those gas plants should be relocated, Mr. Speaker. We implemented that decision, and I've been very open about that. Premier, I don't want to hear from the government House Leader. You own this. You were the campaign chair for the Liberal Party. You signed the memorandum to Cabinet. You are now the Premier of Ontario. You knew the true cost, Order. and you have not told this Assembly what that true cost is, despite my colleague from Nipissing and I asking you 32 times in committee. Ask 
asking you exactly what those other testimonies said you knew. You knew from the outset it was over $40 million. You made this decision to save seats, including the finance minister who sits beside you. Our question back to you, Minister, Premier, not to the government house leader. Are you withholding what you knew when you knew it because your caucus, your cabinet and yourself would all be held in contempt? Order. Premier. Leader. The member from Thornhill comes to order. The member from Whitby, Oshawa. The member, the member who's not in her seat comes to order. The member from Thornhill. And I'll go through the next time. I'll throw you out. If you're testing my resolve, I'll win. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I'm not surprised that the Honourable Member from Renfrew come to order last time. I'm not surprised that the Honourable Member doesn't want to hear from me because, unfortunately, I remind her of something, Mr. Speaker, and that is the fact that her party aggressively, Mr. Speaker, aggressively campaigned against those plants and said if they form government, they would cancel it. Exactly. Jeff Janicek, their a candidate who will not appear in front of committee, put out a, told Mississauga News only Conservative leader Tim Hudak will cancel the Eastern Power Gas Plant slated to be built on Laurelin Avenue. He tweeted, Mr. Speaker, an Ontario PC government will stop the plant for good. Mr. Speaker, he was involved in sending out thousands and thousands of robocalls, and my understanding is help greet, help greet of the opposition as he toured the site and said if he became premier, it would be done, done, done. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. You don't know when, but you'll be surprised. <coughs> New question. The member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier. Premier, real leadership means asking tough questions, being accountable. Why didn't the Premier ever ask her predecessor how much it cost to cancel the Oakville and Mississauga gas plants when she was on the campaign as co chair, when she was signing cabinet documents? Or when she became premier. premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I think that you know, I think that is a legitimate and a good question. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, that there were negotiations that went on, and and it it was a, a confidential negotiation. It was a business process, Mr. Speaker. And as we have seen, there were not firm numbers available, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. And we relied on the information that was given to us by the through the Ministry of Energy that came to them through the OPA, Mr. Speaker. That is the reality. That is what I said at committee because that is the truth, Mr. Speaker and we dealt with the numbers that, that were given us. I think what's extremely important, Mr. Speaker, is we put in place a better process going forward. We're proposing an improved um, regional planning process that would lead to a better, a better placement of these large uh, pieces of energy infrastructure going forward, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the Liberal scandal over the cancellation of the gas plants caused the last Premier to lose his job, along with that of the Minister of Energy. Ontarians expect accountability, yet the former and current Premiers both say they never talked about costs. No matter that she was the co-chair of the election committee, the Liberal campaign, she signed ca cabinet documents authorizing expenditure of funds or when she was appointed Premier. Ignoring these problems doesn't mean they're going to go away. Is that the sort of leadership we should expect? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, the question of establishing costs uh, has been a challenge from the beginning. Uh, I think everyone would agree with that. But Mr. Speaker, the important point uh, here, the important date, is September 12, 2012. 
On September, 12th, uh, uh, September 24, 2012, the OPA filed a 216-page contract which set out the sunk costs and it set out formula in terms of calculating the cost. Mr. Speaker, it's important to know that a couple of weeks ago, when the uh, CEO of the Ontario Power Authority was here before committee, he came with two different costs. And he also had provided a third different cost Answer. about two or three weeks earlier, Mr. Speaker. And the opposition uh, at that particular committee meeting had a fourth cost. Thank you. We had the Auditor General look. Thank you. New question? The member from Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. Speaker, as we all know, uh, our government tabled a budget last week, a budget that's a roadmap to not just a prosperous Ontario, but also a fair Ontario. And Speaker, I have to tell you this, that I actually looked up the titles of the past 17 budgets, and never does the word... That's enough. Jeez. So, Speaker, I was just mentioning that I actually took the trouble to look at the titles of the last 17 budgets, and this is the first time the word fair or a word like fair pops up, a testimony to the values of this Premier and this government, and I'm very proud to be part of that. Coming back to the question, so, Speaker, I know that the budget question. talks a lot about our transit, and I just wanted the Minister to speak. It's particular. I guess you asked for it. The member from Northumberland, Quinty West, is warned. <laughs> Carry on. Minister, if you could speak to the particulars of the transit plan in this budget. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. We are right now uh, increasing our investments in transit over the next three years, Mr. Speaker. We're, we are starting uh, this year with $3.5 billion, Mr. Speaker. Next year it grows to $4 billion and just over $4 billion in 2015-2016, Mr. Speaker. We're doing this for a very good reason, because Ontarians need to get to work, they need to get home, young people need to get to jobs, uh, and transit is critical for that. So we see, uh, Mr. Member Speaker, for Bruce Gray, Old Sound come to order. The member from into uh, brand new beautiful uh, subway uh, cars operating order. in downtown Toronto. Six hundred million dollars on Ottawa's LRT, a really remarkable uh, investment in Kitchener Waterloo, Mr. Speaker. We have three hundred million dollars in that community. Answer. Remarkable RT, RT plus eight hundred and seventy. The test was put, and I'm putting it. The member from Northumberland, Quinty West, is named. If you guys haven't got the idea that I'm not happy right now, you better get it. Finish your answer, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have $870 million right now in a trust, uh, in the Move Ontario Trust, which is building the largest expansion of our subway uh, system in decades, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is resulting in 30,000 jobs for Ontarians, Mr. Answer. Speaker, across the province, which is a remarkable investment and a great return on investment in transit and employment, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for that update on transit. I know that the constituents of Mississauga East Cooksville will be very pleased to hear about our continued commitment to transit. But the reality, Minister, is that if you live in Mississauga, not everybody can take transit. A lot of my constituents do take the highway. So I also wanted to get an update on what this government and what our infrastructure plan has in store when it comes to our highways. Thank you, Minister. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the member who has been such a great advocate for transit and transportation investments is quite right, Mr. Speaker. And there are synergies between the two. So we are adding uh, 16,000 new parking spaces on our go line. So if you're on your way to town and you, you're in traffic, you can jump. Uh, you can jump onto a go service as well. But specifically on highways, Mr. Speaker, we are widening key sections of Highway 4, 401 in the GTHA and Highway 417 in Ottawa, Highways 11 and 17 between. In Thunder Bay and Nipigon, Mr. Speaker, and the rather remarkable Herb Gray Parkway getting ready for the new uh, bridge.
crossing in Windsor, which is critical to trade development. Mr. Speaker, we have improvements to Highway 17 in, Ren in Renfrew County, 401, Mr. Speaker, in, uh, in Northumberland County, and Highway 66 in northeastern Ontario. Mr. Yes, uh, finally, Mr. Speaker, we're, we have the planned extension of Highway 427 to Major Mackenzie in York Regions and new HOV lanes, Mr. Speaker, on sections Thank of you. Highway 401, 404, and 410, 427. Thank you. New question. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week in the Justice Committee, you refused to answer the question as to when you knew that the cancellation of the Oakville gas plant would be exceeding $40 million. In fact, you refused to ask, answer that question no less than 32 times. This in spite of the fact that seven witnesses, including the OPA CEO Colin Anderson, testified under oath that you and all of your cabinet knew all along that the cost would exceed $40 million. A recent poll found that a large majority of Ontarians believe that your government has not been truthful about the cost of the Oakville plant cancellation and relocation that you provided to the public. Premier, your credibility is in tatters. Yes, no there is only one thing left to do. Call our want of confidence motion so that this assembly can decide Questions? on your fate. Here, Thank here. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, as I've said many times, I, I went to committee. I answered the questions that were put to me. I told the committee everything that that I knew, and that is that is part of uh, my my uh, attempt to be as open as possible, Mr. Speaker, and to provide the answers and to provide the documentation that was being asked for. But, Mr. Speaker, in terms of the confidence motion, you know we have a very large confidence issue before this House right now, and that is the budget, Mr. Speaker. And the budget speaks to the need to uh, address issues that affect people's everyday lives. It speaks to the need to put in place the conditions to create jobs, to work with business, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that, that young people have an opportunity to have a placement or a co-op or an internship, Mr. Speaker, so that they can have an opportunity to get into the workplace because youth unemployment yes, is an issue that we need to deal with. Those are the things that I believe we need to be uh, dealing with right now, Mr. Speaker. I hope the member opposite is going Thank to read you. the budget and that he may consider yeah, supporting us. Supplementary. I hardly think a, a budget co-written by you and the NDP is a confidence Aww. issue. Premier, the obstructionist tactics by you and your Liberal Party are now well established. Your former staff have shown to have selective memory. Your government denies unequivocal evidence contained in released documents. Your government claims that sworn testimony by witnesses in committee is false. It is clear that your government will do anything to avoid coming clean and allowing the truth to get out. You're afraid to face the truth. I don't know how any member of this House can prop up this government in good conscience. I ask you again, Premier, will you today call on this Assembly to debate our want, want of confidence motion so this issue can be dealt with once and for all? Here, here. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Leader. Sir Speaker, afraid to face the truth. This is the Premier. Mr. Energy, come to order. She became, uh, took over the office, asked the Auditor General to look into the matter, offered a select committee, which they rejected. Mr. Speaker, she offered a complete document search across government. They rejected it, Mr. Speaker. If we want to talk about the truth, Mr. Speaker, let's talk about Jeff Yanisik. Where is he, Mr. Speaker? Why will he not appear in front of the committee? Let's talk about Marianne de Monte Whalen. Why will she not appear in front of the committee and talk about her brochure that said the only party that will stop the Sherway power plant is the Ontario PC party? And what about the leader of the Progressive Conservatives, Mr. Speaker, who keeps saying he may show up at committee, maybe the 7th, but no, maybe the 14th if it fits his schedule? Mr. Speaker, when yes, asked sir. the Premier was there and the leader of the opposition should offer the same response respect to this legislature and to this committee. The question, the member for Nickelbelt. Thank you, Speaker. Question for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Hi. The company that contracted the outsourcing of the diluted chemo drugs. Their testimony was in stark contrast to that of Marchese, the supplier of the diluted chemo drugs. But to Ontario's patient, all they see is a lot of finger pointing, but none of the accountability, none of the oversight that they know is needed. Will the minister admit that her office stood back 
and did nothing while oversight of our health care system vanished. Thank you. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Uh, speaker, I completely reject that notion. I can tell you that we have one of the finest cancer care systems in the world. The member opposite has acknowledged that. We have an excellent cancer care system with very strong oversight, but it, we have learned that it was not perfect. We have learned that there are steps that need to be taken and that are being taken to be able to give the assurance to patients that when, when their doctor orders a drug, they get exactly that drug in exactly the concentration that was ordered. Speaker, that work is, going, uh, is ongoing as we speak. We aren't wasting time. We're moving forward fixing that issue, Speaker. We're also looking forward to the uh, uh, committee report and the report of Dr. Jake Thiessen, who is looking at the safety of the entire cancer drug supply Answer. chain. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the minister has done nothing while outsourcing grew, and with it, the risk of errors. I asked Medby yesterday, what had they done to mitigate that risk, that higher level of risk. Their answer was really clear, nothing. It's not their job. It's the Ministry of Health's job to provide oversight and accountability. <laughs> but the truth is, they fail in their primary responsibility. Does the minister agree that it is time to adopt better measures of accountabilities and oversight so that Ontario's patients can start to rebuild their faith and trust in our health care system. Uh, speaker, um, you can rest assured that I am as committed to resolving this issue as anyone. It is people in London, in my community, who have, have been impacted by this, other communities as well. I think everyone in London either knows someone or knows someone who knows someone who was impacted by this. We must pay attention. We must make the changes that will strengthen our system further, and that's exactly the work that Dr. Jake Thiessen is doing right now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sports. Ontario has emerged as the largest live music market in both Canada and North America. Here, here. It is a business that generates $455 million in revenues and contributes $252 million annually to the national economy. Great question. To ensure that we truly become a world leader, constituents in my riding of Scarborough Asian Court have asked what is the government doing to coordinate live music marketing and promotions plan. They want to know how Ontario is leveraging existing resources and creating opportunities to promote music while utilizing online resources. Speaker, to you to the minister, what is the government doing to actively position Ontario as a global destination to live music and music tourism? Thank you, thank you, Speaker. Thank you for the question. I want to thank the member from Scarborough Asian Court for asking. Speaker, Ontario's entertainment and creative industry support 300,000 jobs, generating $20 billion to our economy. This is why, in a recent budget, we have committed providing $45 million in grants over three years starting this year for a new Ontario Music Fund. Speaker, the fund will support Ontario's live music, positioning the promise as a leading player. The member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek, come to order. Music. In addition, Speaker, our government is providing over $5 million through Celebrate Ontario to host music festivals and events throughout the year. Through this funding, Speaker, combined with our new Ontario yes, Music sir. Fund, we are strengthening Ontario's position on the map as a premier destination for live performances. Thank you, Thank Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, this news is music to my ears. I want to thank the minister for his leadership and ensuring that we turn up the volumes on the world like stage it. and bringing Canadian recordings to global audience. There is no doubt the government's budgetary commitments will sharpen our competitive edge to make Ontario a global music capital. The culture sector's overall certainly plays a key role in driving an innovative, creative. Uh, economy where in Ontario and it contributes more than $20 billion annually to that economy. I know in my riding of Scarborough Asian Court, hundreds of youth perform, Great create and seek out opportunity in the city and across Ontario. Speaker, to you to the minister, what is the government doing to invest in creative talents we are so proudly possess in Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Thank you again, Speaker. In addition to the $45 million Ontario Music Fund, Speaker, 
we will also provide 8 million to support Mass Sea Horse revitalization. The renewal, thank you. The renewal of this iconic landmark will allow Massey Hall to continue to contribute to the growth of Ontario's performing arts scene as a fully functional modern venue. Speaker, as well, our government will provide funding of $9 million over three years to support the Canadian Film Centre, supporting educational programs for advanced film, television and new media. Speaker, Ontario's cultural scene is an incubator of great talent. This is why we will continue to invest and make our promise a creative hub and a world-class destination. Speaker, the bottom line, creating jobs and strengthening our economy. Thank you. Thank you. Question, member from Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My question uh, today is for the Premier. Premier, within 72 hours of releasing your big spending, job-killing budget, two major manufacturing companies shut down their Ontario plants. Waterloo Furniture and Kitchener is relocating to Michigan and putting more than 230 people out of work, while heavy equipment giant Caterpillar is closing yet another Ontario factory, this time in Toronto, and throwing an additional 330 workers out of a job. It is clear that Ontario's manufacturing sector no longer has confidence in the McGuinty Wynne Horvath government. That's right. Premier, will you explain how this House can have confidence in your government? when your lack of leadership is driving yes. away business and costing us Ontario jobs. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, of course, it is uh, truly unfortunate and very upsetting to hear uh, whenever a company uh, chooses to close or relocate its, uh, its business, and we're obviously very concerned about the well-being of the workers and their families and are working hard uh, with them, not only my ministry, but the Ministry of Training, Colleges and Universities. In fact, we have, through our rapid re-employment re and training services, within an hour of us being notified, one hour of being notified by, uh, uh, of a plant uh, or facility closure, uh, Training, Colleges and Universities actually reaches out uh, to uh, the employer as well as to the union. Uh, they've done so in both cases, both uh, here in Toronto with Caterpillar and, uh, and in, uh, with, with NAEP and Voigt in, in Kitchen and in the supplementary, uh, because uh, I, I don't want uh, the viewers, let alone the opposition, to not be aware of what the important things we're doing. I'll speak to that. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Speaker. And back to the Premier. But what is sad is the reality that is facing uh, the province of Ontario, and that is that we have nearly 600,000 men and yep. women out of work and an yeah. unemployment rate of 7.7 per cent. Even worse, Ontario's unemployment rate has been above the national average for 75 consecutive months. That's a scandal. With Ontario's interest well, payments Maine, set to rise to over $14.5 billion per year, it is no problem. While I was telling him to come to order, he was still barking, so the member from Eglinton Lawrence, come to order. Carry on. And uh, Hamilton East, <laughs> don't need your help on that one. <laughs> uh, Premier, with Ontario's interest rates set to rise to over $14.5 billion per year, oh, it is no wonder that manufacturing that companies are fleeing from Ontario's huge debt, layers of red tape, and liberal gas plant scandals. Scandal. Premier, when Portion. do you admit that you and your government are not equipped to address the jobs and debt crisis in this province and, in fact, no longer hold the confidence of this House? Thank yes. you. Yes. Yes, well, Mr. Speaker, I still can't understand why the member opposite continues to beat down our businesses and manufacturers across this province. And since, since the bottom of the recession, Mr. Speaker, we've created nearly 400,000 new jobs. We brought back all of the jobs that were lost, and then 50 percent more, including 50,000 just last year. In fact, in the auto sector, just last month, they had the best April since 2008. Manufacturing in February has gone up as well across the country, led by Ontario. In fact, it was four times in February the consensus estimate, and most of that actually has been through production. So we're working hard. I hope the member opposite sees in the budget and will support it the efforts that we're making. $295 million for youth employment. We've ex continue for an additional three years the accelerated capital cost allowance, which has been very well received. The factor is estimated at $250 million and increase the threshold for the employer health tax. These are the measures that Ontarians want that support our businesses. Thank you. Question. The member from Essex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my, my question is to the Premier. 
Premier's racetracks across Ontario closed down and thousands of related jobs are lost in rural Ontario, this government is trying to reshuffle the decks and devise a special casino hosting deal for Toronto. Now, the Doug Ford Booster Club to the extreme right of me are evidently big fans of downtown Doug's Toronto casino plant. I want to know if you are too. Will the Premier finally show her cards on the new casino formula and come clean on Ontarians about how much she's anteing up to convince Toronto to host a downtown casino? Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, let me be clear yet again. We are treating the entire province equally. We are not making a special deal for Toronto or any other region. We recognize the importance of the OLG. We all appreciate the transformational changes necessary to accommodate better value for these investments. And we also know that, it, that there's a lot of money at stake to support hospitals and education and our social programs. So we will continue to do what's right for the people of Ontario, and we're not giving any special favors to any region. Mr. Speaker. Speaker, rural Ontario is being dealt a massive blow with the decision to cancel the slots at racetrack program. Thousands of jobs are being lost across the province due to the cancellation of this program, and thousands more will be lost in the near future. Premier, this isn't penny pea knuckle in Grandma's parlour. Ontarians have a right to know if their government's playing a backroom deal for big states. Why is this Premier? Seriously. Is there any doubt that uh, I have to mention that I could go again? Please finish. Thank you, Speaker. Why is this Premier seriously considering a hosting option favoring Toronto over all other communities? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the whole premise around the transformational change of the OLG is in fact to secure more jobs, support the industry, and support those communities that are affected. What we want is to resolve and actually further the situation in those border towns that are being affected negatively at this point. So I thought and I would believe that all members of the House would support the initiatives that we're doing to try to protect those communities and to ensure that people who are affected are better served. And we will continue to do that, but no region is going to have a special deal, Mr. Speaker. No region. At all. Thank you. Your question, a member from Hopeville. Thank you, Speaker. I've got a question this morning for the Minister of Child and Youth Services. We're all aware in this House that this is Child and Youth Mental Health Week across the country. Today, almost one in five children suffer from a mental health illness. Approximately 70% of all mental health illnesses begin in childhood. We're all aware of the importance of providing our children and youth with the right supports when it comes to their mental health. In my own community of Oakville, this is a concern I hear often from my constituents. So, Speaker, would the minister please tell us and the House what we are doing in this year's budget to ensure that the mental health, specifically, of Ontario's children and youth is being looked after? Thank you. Minister. <laughs> I am. I'm waiting. Oh, yeah, it's all right. Go ahead. Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Oakville for bringing up this very important issue today, especially this week. Later today, I will be delivering a statement on how mental health issues affect our families and communities, and also how this government has made providing the right support a top priority. I'm extremely proud that in this year's budget, funding for the Comprehensive Mental Health and Addiction Strategy is increasing to $93 million annually. This budget's investment is necessary to give young people the essential supports they need. The investment in this budget will help to deliver services when and where children and youth need them. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that answer. I'm glad to hear this government's made a strong commitment in this budget to the mental health and children of youth in Ontario because it's sorely needed. I know that in my community of Oakville, frontline mental health services and programs that are available to young people can make a huge difference in their daily lives. Those services that are in, able to engage youth can make a big impact in the path that they decide to take and on the road to their recovery. So helping young people realize they're not alone can, can literally, in this case, mean the difference between life and death. 
The question is, Speaker, what is the government doing to ensure that more frontline services will be available to all of Ontario's youth? Mr. Children and Youth Services. Thank you. Speaker, our government has, has made progress in our mental health and addiction strategy. In the last year, my ministry has made significant investments to ensure that all children and youth have timely access to frontline services. 456 new mental health workers were placed in communities across the province to go along with 144 new mental health nurses in schools. Some of these centres that provide the services I have worked to, their, to these workers, these services work and are needed in our schools. As well, my ministry is hiring 80 new Aboriginal mental health and addiction workers for high-needs Aboriginal communities. Our investments, Answer. Speaker, will help over 35,000 young people across the province. We are proud of these achievements, and through this year's budget, we Thank will you. continue to move forward. No question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Trades and Employment. Minister, I hope you're aware of the dire problems facing marinas and other small businesses in Georgian Bay. Because of declining water levels in the upper Great Lakes, marinas and other businesses have had to spend tens of millions of dollars of their own money dredging the bay in order to be open for this summer season. Sturgeon Point Marina in Masaga Beach, for example, has spent $130,000 on dredging and has an annual additional business loss of $20,000 because of the low water levels. Without the dredging, hundreds of people will be without work and the tourism industry will suffer. Minister, with your responsibilities in economic development and employment, how will you assist these marinas and other small businesses? Thank you, Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Natural Resources. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the member opposite uh, for the question. Obviously, this is an issue that's top of mind for all of us in the province. As you're aware, the uh, IJC has recently released a report with respect to uh, the changing water levels and the challenges that we're facing, uh, you know, and there are a number of factors uh, causing this, and there are obviously some effects that uh, individuals and businesses are facing in the Georgian Bay area. I uh, will tell you that uh, this Friday I will be with the Premier and a number of other ministers at the Phnom Conference. I know we'll be hearing firsthand about those uh, particular challenges. And at the uh, Ministry of Natural Resources, we're going to do everything we can to accelerate the uh, dredging permits that are going to be requested because we know that there's a, there's a uh, finite uh, period of time that uh, this needs to be done in to ensure that these businesses uh, can operate. Thank you. Supplementary. The member from Simcoe North. I'd like the Minister of uh, Economic Development to actually answer this because it's a jobs creation a question. Minister, the low water levels on Georgian Bay have become a natural disaster that could possibly impact thousands of tourism jobs. Marinas have had to spend millions of dollars, dollars that they do not have, just to open for this season. Clearly, we have seen millions of dollars spent by your government on power plant closures and a dysfunctional regional tourism organization. Georgian Bay Marinas and other businesses need your help so these jobs, these jobs can be saved. Real jobs. The state of Michigan has a program and the checks are being sent out. When can Ontario Marinas expect the same treatment as the, as the Marinas in, in Michigan? Yeah, when? Minister. Again, uh, Speaker, I want to thank the members opposite for raising this very, very important issue. And on this side of the House, we're also very concerned about the low water levels and the uh, potential negative impact that is having uh, in our communities and uh, with respect to our businesses and our industries. Uh, the Minister of Tourism, I know, has uh, spoken to me about this issue. The Minister of Municipal Affairs is also very concerned about this. We are going to be uh, in the area for the Phnom Conference this week, and I'm happy to uh, engage with those individuals bringing that to our attention. I ha have had some conversation with individuals and organizations with respect to dredging and ensuring that they have the opportunity to get their uh, tourist operations moving so that those businesses can put people to work. We are very concerned about that. We're going to do everything we can to ensure that program process takes place uh, effectively Answer. and that those businesses can get the support that they need. Thank you. New question. The member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, yesterday I met with constituents of Davenport who are paying the price for a gaping loophole in Ontario's rent control law. Like tens of thousands of other tenants across Ontario, these people live in rental units built after 1991, which means they are not covered by rent increase guidelines in the Residential Tenancies Act. As a result, these tenants face large and often arbitrary rent increases that are simply not affordable. 
Speaker, will the minister commit to close this outdated loophole which exempts these rental units from rent control? Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Speaker, and I really want to thank the member for the question. This is certainly an important issue, and our government has consistently shown commitment to protecting tenants across Ontario. The Residential Tenancies Act from 2006 provides tenants and landlords with strong, balanced protection while fostering a robust rental housing market. Though rental buildings built or first occupied under, uh, after November 1991 are exempt from most rent caps under the tenancy, Residential Tenancy Act, these tenants are not without protection. We understand how important stability in the rental prices are for tenants. That's why the Rental Tenancy Act still only allows for one increase per year, requiring a 90-day written notice to tenants of all residences, uh, rental residences. We also established the Landlord Tenant Board. That will as an independent body that works with the authority to adjudicate disputes between landlords and tenants. Here's supplementary. Speaker, thank you. With all due respect, that's not the issue. This loophole serves no purpose. It has to be closed. It's created a two-tier rental market in Ontario. It's left almost 60,000 Ontario tenant households vulnerable with no rent control. Tenants in Ontario, including many people who rent condos, face uncertainty and financial hardship. So, when will the minister acknowledge this unfairness and protect all tenants in Ontario from this loophole? Thank you, Minister. So, Speaker, as I was saying, uh, this landlord and tenant board, uh, can, the tenant can take the landlord to court, uh, and certainly if the maintenance standards aren't being met, or if there's a, if the landlord needs to make uh, repairs, we also eliminated automatic uh, evictions, allowing all tenants who face eviction an opportunity to get a fair hearing because we think that's important. We think it's important to balance protection of tenants with the encouragement of building new rental opportunities. Certainly, this. Uh, we want to make sure that tenants have a safe and affordable housing, and we know that the City of Toronto is preparing a report on this issue. We look forward to hearing ideas from the opposition as well as other stakeholders about making residential tenancies uh, affordable, and we want to work with them as well as the uh, Residential Tenancy Act. We want to seek consultation of people who are affected by legislation that affects them uh, in, a, in a negative way. So I appreciate the question. Thank you. Your policy, Joe. The Minister of Immigration and uh, Citizenship on a point of order. I recognize uh, Rosemary Sadler for the Ontario Black History Society, who's in the West Gallery here today. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, our guests. You all know the first votes. This house stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.